recording. <clears throat> Sabbath peace. It's another opportunity for us to come together in here and learn of the word of truth as given to us by the Most High God. All honor goes to the Father through the Son, whose name is Yahushua. In him lies the only hope for salvation. We know that it is obtained by grace through faith, not of works, lest anyone should boast, and given freely as a gift to all who obey him. We understand that if you do not obey him, it is made manifest or made obvious that you do not believe. In this state, you should expect no good thing from the Most High. However, anything that you do get, whether it be a gift of tongues, a gift of prophecy, or any supernatural experience that you may have, it can and it will be used against us in the day of judgment. With that said, peace to the saints that are, uh, that are not in the room, <laughs> to the saints that uh, couldn't make it, uh, to the saints that uh, are watching them from the cam camera, but no peace to the wicked. The only thing we say to them is repent that they might live. All right. Yeah, I'm rocking at Dolo over here today because, uh, you know, what I mean, had an unfortunate series of events this week. Uh, but I think the most high God at the family is good. And uh, that, uh, you know, the neighborhood is OK. Uh, we'll keep it pressing forward uh, with the mind and with the goal that nothing gets in the way of God's plan. Uh, we can continue to, to stand steadfast on his word with unwavering faith in what he'll do for us and what he'll what he'll provide to us. Uh, with that said, let's go ahead and pick up with a small recap of uh, of the events that we've kind of talked through over the last several weeks. I know we skipped one or so, <clears throat> but let's kind of look at it. Um, so let's see if we look here. Let me put my little red laser on here. All right, so we had a series of kings that we talked about. All right, so Jeroboam, Nadab. Baasha, Elah, Zimri, Tibni, Amri, Ahab, Ahaziah, and then Joram. And then lastly, last week we talked about Jehu. Remember, Jehu killed all of the seed of uh, Amri and Ahab. Um, he killed Je Jezebel. She fell from the top of the building. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know what I'm saying, the, the animals began to eat her, eat her and nobody <laughs> had... Uh, Nobody could recognize that it was her body, according to the prophecy. Um, and then down below with the southern kingdom, we had the descendants of Solomon, uh, Rehoboam, Abijam, uh, Asa, Jehoshaphat. And you had uh, Jehoram, Ahaziah, and uh, Athaliah is just at the point where she's trying to take control. Remember, Athaliah was actually the sister to Ahab. All right, so you have Athaliah now beginning to take, I'm sorry, no, not the sister, the daughter to Ahab. Um, that was Ahab's daughter. So now she's beginning to take over uh, and try to rule in the kingdom of Judah. So weeks and weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago, we had already read uh, this from Chronicles. I think it was Second Chronicles 22. But then we needed to go into Elisha a little bit. So a lot of what we've been reading over the last few weeks was over the life of Elisha. And we saw all the different miracles that Elisha did because Elisha got a double portion of Elijah's spirit. So you can see the, the prophets here. You have the prophet Elijah right here, and then you had a prophet Elisha. And you can see Elisha's run is a lot longer. So we're nearing, we're, we're, we're you know, kind of getting to where we're getting close to the end of Elisha's uh, life because we're about right here. Alicia is going to go about right here. So let's um, let's pick up where we uh, left off. We left off kind of talking about Athaliah. This is after Jehu killed Athaliah's brothers. Uh, and then Jehu also killed all the family of Ahab, according to the prophecy. He also killed um, Athaliah's uh, son. So Athaliah now steps in and Athaliah killed all of her, her grandchildren to make sure that no one else took the kingdom, right? So she jumped in, but there was one person that, uh, that, that, that jumped in and helped out, and that's what we're going to read. Um, it's going to be Athaliah's daughter. Or I, I, won't, I don't want to say Athaliah's daughter. Let's say it's going to be Ahaziah, the king of Judah, that had just died with Joram. It's going to be his sister. Right. So that may be her daughter or, you know, she may be a daughter to another woman. But 
uh, is going to be his sister for sure. Uh, so let's let's pick that up in um, Second Kings chapter what eleven? Yeah, Second Kings chapter eleven. All right. And when Athaliah, the mother of Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, she arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stale him from among the king's sons, which were slain. And they hid him. Right. So now she took she took Joash. So Joash was a, a, a son of Ahaziah. Right. And he was a baby. Book about the letters knows, a, you know, says a small child. So she took him because she saw all the other kids were being killed. So she tried to preserve one. Watch this. Even him and his nurse in the bedchamber from Athaliah so that he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord six years. And Athaliah did reign over the land. In the seventh right. year. So for six years, Athaliah reigned over the, uh, over the land. And for those same six years, the baby, remember the baby had a nurse, so the baby was still, you know what I'm saying, still, you know, sucking on the breast. And the baby was getting milk. So the nurse was taken also, and they were hidden inside of the temple. So they went into the house of Yahuwah, right? So remember, we had this big temple. It's right next to the kingdom of Judah, right? And they hid him inside of that temple, inside of that structure where the priest would normally operate. And that's just somewhere where people weren't allowed to go. Right. So that's a good hiding spot for the kid. So now the kid is in there with the nurse and the nurse is taking care of the kid while Athaliah is just running amok. Right. And this is happening over a span of six years. Keep going. In the seventh year, Jehoiada sent and fed the rulers over hundreds with the captains of the guard and brought them in and brought them to him into the house of the Lord and made a covenant with them, and took an oath of them in the house of the Lord, and showed them the king's son. And he commanded them, saying, This is the thing that you shall do. A third part of you that enter in on the Sabbath shall even be keepers of the watch of the king's house. And the third part shall be at the gate of Sir, and a third part at the gate behind the guard. So shall ye keep the watch of the house, that it be not broken down. And two right. parts of so all it's a man named Jehoiada that comes by, and Jehoiada looks at it, he starts to put together a plan. He's looking like, okay, the boy is getting older now, right? That means the risk is increasing, right? We might be able to pass for a baby, like she may not know what's going on. But as the boy gets older, the risk starts to increase. So he said, you know what? We're going to take, take the captains, and we're going to split the captains into three. He said, okay, y'all y'all enter in on the Sabbath, and y'all keep watch. He told some of them, y'all go stand over there. Y'all go stand at the gates, right? And so he made, he made the, a, a certain group of soldiers and captains keep watch over the boy just to protect him. Watch this. In the third part at the gate behind the guard, so shall ye keep the watch of the house that it be not broken down. In two parts of all you that go forth on the Sabbath, even they shall keep the watch of the house of the Lord about the king. And ye shall compass the king round about, every man with his weapons in hand. And he and he that comes within the ranges, let him be slain. And be ye with the king as he goes out and as he comes in. And the captains over the hundreds did according to all the things that Jehoiada the priest commanded. And they took every man his men that were to come in on the Sabbath with them that should go out on the Sabbath and came to Jehoiada the priest. And all the in the cap and to the captains over hundreds did the priests give King David spears and shields that were in the temple of Yahuwah. And the guard stood, every man with his weapons in his hand, round about the king from the right corner of the temple to the left corner of the temple, along by the altar in the temple. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him right, king. So now this is the high priest. The high priest then brought forth the son and put the crown on him, so he's making the son the king, right? Because now Athaliah is running, but it wouldn't, be a, it wouldn't be appropriate for our culture for Athaliah to be a, a, a queen over us. So what she's doing, she's doing in rebellion, right? It's so it's not a, something that we case. recognize. So he, we're just trying to make him king because now he's old enough, and he's still a kid. 
right? Keep going. All right, what'd you say? And she also not a son of David. That's right. Yeah, it's nothing about it's nothing about her and what she's trying to do that would be recognized by our people as legitimate. She just has authority. It would be the same as if the as as uh, as when the king of Egypt or we're we're gonna later read that the king of Egypt takes over us, right? It'll be the same as that, right? When they when they take us over and they and they they have us for tribute and we have to pay them taxes and things of that nature, that's kind of what Athaliah is. It's like yeah, she's ruling over us, but we don't respect it from an Israelite law standpoint, right? We just respect respect it from a fact that if we don't do what she say, she gonna kill us. All right, so keep going. Let's see what she got. And he brought forth the king's son and put the crown upon him and gave him the testimony. And they made him king and anointed him. And they clapped their hands and said, God save the king. And when Athaliah God heard the noise. God save the king. And when Athaliah heard the noise of the guard and of the people, she came to the people into the temple of Yahuwah. And when she looked, behold, the king stood by a pillar as the manor was. And as the princes and the trumpet, trumpeters by the king and all the people of the land rejoiced and blew the trumpets. And Athaliah ripped her clothes and cried, Treason! Treason! But Jehoiada mm -hmm. the priest commanded the captains of the hundreds and the officers of the host and said unto them, Have her forth without the ranges. And him that followed her, kill him with the sword. Kill with the sword. For the priest had said, Let her not be slain in the house of Yahuwah. And they laid hands on her, and she went by the way by which the horses came into the king's house, and there she was slain. Mm -hmm. And Jehoiada made a covenant between Yahuwah and the king and the people, and they sh that they should be Yahuwah's people, between the king also and the people. And the people of the land went into the house of Baal and break it down. His altars and his images, they break in pieces thoroughly and slew Matan, the priest of Baal, before, all, before the altars. And the priest anointed officers over the house of Yahuwah. And he took the rulers over hundreds and captains over the guard, and all the people of the land that they brought down the king from the house of Yahuwah and came by the way of the gate of the guard to be the king's to the king's house. And he sat mm -hmm. on the throne of the kings. And all the people of the land rejoiced, and the city was in quiet, and they slew Athaliah with the sword beside the king's house. Seven years old was Jehoash when he began to reign. All right, so he was only seven. He was a seven year old. Right? He was a seven year old when he began to reign. It's important to know that because we, we, sometimes we've been, uh, we've been conditioned to, to think of, of, of ages as a complete limiter. But sometimes, sometimes it's due to put heavy responsibilities on children. Sometimes there's no option. There's no choice. And this is an extreme example, but there was no choice here. Because the options were let the seed of David not continue with um, uh, with passing down the kingdom or let him rule. So we had to save this kid. He's the only kid. He's a baby at the time. We nurse him up until he's six. At seven years old, it's time for this boy to become king. And once he's king, now we have something that the people can get behind. And then the people then ride up on Athaliah and they take Athaliah out. But this is still a seven-year-old boy. So now we have to think about what advantage does this seven-year-old boy have versus maybe his father or his father's father? Right? What advantage might he have? He was raised by the priest. That boy was raised by the priest. So you remember we talked about a couple of weeks ago, we was talking about, I think it's Exodus chapter 34. Matter of fact, let's grab it real quick. Grab Exodus chapter 34. Uh, you're going to have to help me out on what verse. I don't know why I never remember this verse, but I want to say maybe verse, I don't know, 18, 19. It's probably higher up than that. Maybe verse 7. It should be Exodus, Exodus chapter 34. What verse you think? Uh, no, I was, I was asking you. Yeah, I think it's like, let's start with probably seven, somewhere around there, maybe nine, but let's start with seven. Keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, 
that will by no means clear the guilty. That's Visiting right. So hold on. Let's go back. That was seven. If that was seven, give me uh, give me five. And the Lord descended in the cloud and stood with him uh -huh. there to proclaim the name of Yahuwah. Uh-huh. And the Lord passed by before him and proclaimed, Yahuwah, Yahuwah God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping That's mercy right. to thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgressions and sin, and that by no means will clear by the guilty. By no means does he clear the guilty. You understand? It's, it's, it's di this is a very difficult concept to understand, especially after we've been indoctrinated by uh, Islam and by Judaism and by Christianity and Hebrew Israelitism and, and all these other isms that you can think of, right? When, you, when you've already been confused and taught to look at something a certain way, it's harder to kind of erase and look at it the appropriate way. So what this is saying is, He's saying, listen, I forgive sin and I have mercy, right? And I forgive iniquity, all that. However, by no means do I clear the guilty, right? And it's because what happens is God is a, most, he's, a he's a God of promises, right? So if he says, if you sin, you shall die. And if you sin, you are cursed. Guess what? You got to die and you got to be cursed. That's book. There's no way around it. And that's what our law tells us. Right. But on the other hand, he's saying, I will also forgive you. Everybody who loves me, I'll forgive you. I have mercy on you. So he has to find a way. Most of our guy has to find a way to make both of those statements true. And apparently to the naked eye, these would be contradictory statements. Right. I have mercy on you. I'll I'll forgive you. But on the other time, you're going to be guilty. And nobody who's guilty is going to be clear. And there's certain things that we've learned throughout our knowledge of the book is, you know, all people fall short. Right? No man goes without sin. All these different things that we've learned and we understand them to be factual. Then he comes back and he tells us by no means has he cleared the guilty. Well, everybody has been guilty. But then they're forgiven. So what does it mean to be forgiven? Let's let's remind ourselves of our interaction with David. We don't have to get it, but if, if you remember, David was speaking to Nathan the prophet. Nathan the prophet gave him a scenario, right? He gave him a parable. And after David heard that parable, it was related to sheep. After David heard that parable, he said, oh, the man that did that to the sheep should die, right? And then... Nathan came back to David and said, you are that man. Because remember, David had Uriah killed because David slept with Uriah's wife. Right? So not only did he commit adultery, but he also had a man killed as a result of that. Right? To try to cover it up. To try to hide it. So the Most High God was very angry about that. He sent Nathan the prophet to him. And Nathan the prophet told him, everything that was going to happen to him and happen to his family, right? At the very end of it, David confessed his sin. He said, I have sinned. And the Most High God said, don't even worry about it. I put away the sin, right? I pardoned it, essentially, right? So I've forgiven it. I put it away. You know what I'm saying? I made it disappear, right? So the Most High God let him know that he made his sin disappear. Now, normally, you would think, okay, I'm no longer guilty. But the very next verse, after the Most High God tell him that he put away the sin, he says, but as a result of the stuff you did, your son is going to die. And then all the things before David confessed his sin that uh, Nathan told him was going to happen, all those things still happened as well, even after the Most High God said, I put away the sin. So there's a reason for that. Grab, uh, what is it, Hebrews, Hebrews 10? What are you looking for? When they... It is appointed once. Uh, it's Hebrews so. 9. Give me Hebrews 9, chapter 20, uh, chapter 9, verse 27.
is Hebrews chapter 9, verse 27. As it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this, judge the judgment. So the Messiah was once offered to bear sins of many, and unto them that look for him shall he appear the second time without sin unto salvation. So now you have to understand how these things are set up. The Most High God can say to a person, I'll forgive your sins because the Messiah bared the sins of many. Everybody who sinned, he took over their sins, right? So then he died and was resurrected. The next time we see the man, he ain't going to be carrying no sin. The next time he's coming back for judgment. So that's why the book is saying it's appointed once for a person to die. That is the guilty. Because every man is guilty, therefore every man has to die. So the moral of the story is the things that we deal with in our flesh. That is the that is the response of guilt and the consequent of sin. So it's different things that we might struggle with, different things that may ail us. Maybe we have a disease or a sickness or a disorder we were born with. Maybe maybe life is just difficult for us. It doesn't seem like we get a lucky break. Right. Things just happen to us. Maybe we have generational curses, things that our family did or things that we did, and it gets passed down to us. We deal with the consequences of it. Maybe we made silly decisions younger. And from those decisions, we have we have split families or we have we have uh, we have uh, infighting or we have things that we got to deal with from some of our negative decisions. We got prison time. We got a we got a record. We got to register as a as a sex offender or we got, you know what I'm saying? Whatever we got to do, we have to deal with these things based off of decisions that we made in the past. And it wouldn't matter if the Most High God spoke to us as a prophet and the Most High God said to us, hey, I've forgiven all of your sin. Guess what? Until you die, by no means is the guilty clear. So what happens is instead you have to die and then in the resurrection is when the forgiveness is fulfilled. You have Christians walking around today and what they say in their mind is, oh, I remember the day I got saved. And what happens is that throws their minds off because they're looking at it as if they, they've already accomplished something. Like it's over. Grab Romans chapter eight. I, ain't, I wasn't even trying to talk today. We really need to get through this stuff, but it's important that we understand some of this stuff. Grab Romans chapter eight. I have no idea what verse, but we're gonna try to muddle through this thing, but let's say verse 28. Romans chapter eight, verse 20. I'll tell you what, if verse 28 is it, that's a bad boy there. Let's do Romans chapter eight, verse 28. You looking for like who hopes for what he has? Mm-hmm. I don't even remember that is, whatever it is. <laughs> huh? I don't remember what that one is. No, no, no. You want 24. It's 24? Yeah. We're going to do 22. Okay. 8, 22. This is, uh, this is, uh, this is, uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 22. Well, we know that the whole creation groans and travails in pain together until now. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. For we are so saved look, Paul, by hope. When Paul was alive, he waiting for it. He ain't walking around talking about, ooh, I'll tell you what, when God saved me. Ooh, I'll tell you, I'll tell you, it was 1991. Clear blue sky outside, I'll never forget it. And I saw the clouds part. And the Most High God spoke from the sky and he said, you, brother, are saved. And that's the day. That's the day that I got saved. That's a lie. That's a lie. You running your, When people get to talking like that, they are running their mouth because they don't know the book. And they think it's a small thing. 
They think it's smart. They think, oh, it ain't no harm in doing that. A lot of people do. A lot of people look at that. Ain't no harm in, in they don't really mean that the day they say, well, no, we have to say what we mean. Book say, we ain't got a key. I ain't going to jump around too much because I said, I, you know, this time through the book, I don't want to jump around too much. So I ain't going to jump around too much. But Peter tell us very clearly, when we speak, we should speak as what? As we know, as the prophet. We got to speak as the oracles of Yah. Mm -hmm. What I'm saying here and act like I'm quoting the book or paraphrasing the book and what I'm saying is contrary, contrary to it. It's a complete contradiction of what's in the book. But I'm talking about, oh, well, it ain't, no, it ain't that big of a deal. It's the same thing. God ain't worried about that. Y'all always talking about what God ain't worried about. At some point, we got to buckle down. We got to look at the book. Because this is what will happen. The enemy will have us calling what's good, bad, and calling what's bad, good. Based off of little things, he'll condition us to start believing, oh, you know what? This is against the book, but that is for the book, and it's completely the opposite. And it happens all the time. Right? So when you look at it, you look at, you can't look at I've been saved in the past. No. Our mindset has to be, man, I'm groaning. I can't wait to see how this is going to play out. How God is going to pull this off. I mean, we know that he's going to save us. Those of us that are obedient to the word. We know that that's coming, but how is he going to pull it off? It's just like we all knew as a people that we were going to have a Messiah come. That's the same Messiah that we're waiting for now. But we had no idea the man was going to come as a very humble ser servant, someone who didn't have comeliness that he should be desired, and then he would die on the cross. We thought he was going to be a warrior. So we had to have that curiosity. Although we know and we have faith that it's going to come out how it's going to come out, we have to have the curiosity to say, how is this going to play out, play for play? And be open to how the Most High God is going to do it. It's too many of us that walk around. So we, it's certain things that people think are arrogant. People think having faith according to the scripture is arrogance. People will look at you because you are confident in the book. And you won't let nobody move you from what the book say. They tell you you arrogant. When the true arrogance is somebody walking around without a lick of knowledge of the book and feeling like, you know what? This is absolutely how God is operating. I can walk around and act like God has already saved me when the whole book is telling you you should be having hope for the resurrection. These people walk around like the Most High God has already written, giving them a flesh of heart and already written his laws on their heart. They think this stuff has already happened in their mind. And they had a nerve to call people like us arrogant. And what do we do? We just stand by the word and stick by what it says. Because it's backwards. We've been confused. And they, honestly, it ain't their fault. It's going to be their fault before God if they don't repent. But it ain't, they ain't the root cause of it. They've been taught this stuff. And the person who taught them, somebody taught them this stuff. I thank God the Most High God is giving us a mind and an opportunity to learn it. But even in that, we shouldn't rest in that. We have to actually learn it and walk in it. Otherwise, we will be in the exact same position. We think we got something. We think we know something. We'll think we understand it better and we'll be in the exact same position if it's not coupled with the love of God. When I say love of God, that means love according to his commandment, not no, not no made up love that people see now. Love people see now, people, it's self-serving. That's why people lie to each other. I watch people tell you, they call it white lies. You tell a white lies because you're trying to control how somebody see you. You don't want them to know. You don't want them to know how you really feel about them or what you really think about them because you're trying to control what they think about you. You don't tell a white lie because of the other person. You're telling it for yourself because you're weak, right? You're weak and you're scared this person might not accept you. You're scared that if you tell them, oh, no, I don't actually don't like that dress much. No, I actually, uh, no, I actually do think those shoes. No, 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 I actually don't think you handled that well. 
right? No, no, no. Actually, no. I think I don't. Honestly, just to be honest with you, I think you got a lot of work before you actually, you know what I'm saying, qualify for that position. Right? That don't mean you walk around, you being rude to people or being nasty. But when somebody asks you a question and you put on the spot, it's the same pressure that you feel when you got to tell a white lie, counter that by telling the truth. Or shut up. Don't say nothing. Right? It'd be better it's not to say nothing than to tell a lie. But when you tell them lies, that's what you tell them. But the reason why you tell them lies because you're trying to control how people see you. Right? And people look at that as humility. Right? Somebody telling somebody a white lie, they look at that as humility. They look at that. They look at that like, oh, that's a that's something noble. Somebody who uh, just shut their mouth or just tell you can tell a person the truth when they tempted to tell a white lie. Instead of telling a white lie, they just tell them the truth. They look at that person maybe as rude or disrespectful. They look at that person as they look at that person as unnecessary, negative, right? But that's how it works. Because what's good is going to be called bad. That's what's happening right now. All we got to do is stand on this word. You have to understand. You have to set yourself up with the expectation that these people, if God's word is true, and the majority of people, 10% of people in all of history, going to be reserved. And that's not necessarily what the books say, but it does mention 10% of people um, in a particular time. But let's just say, just for giggles, 10% of people of all time is going to end up being delivered by the Most High God, right? If that's the case, you have to look at everything around you and say, the mass, 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 90% of people that you met in your entire life don't know God. And I would venture to say even more now, right? In our, in our day and age, I would venture to say we're, we're even more. I'm thinking like the Most High God probably offset this thing a little bit. Like maybe like, maybe back in like, maybe back in like, you know what I'm saying? Back in like the, 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 the first and second century, maybe it was like 30% people, you know what I'm saying, is going to be delivered in that time. And then he balanced it off. Now it's like 0.005%, you know what I'm saying? Like, like in 2023, it might be only 0.005% of people living that's going, you know what I'm saying, see God in it. You know what I'm saying? Because it looks it look scarce out here to me. These people, I'm telling you, these people don't even. People lie in a heartbeat. We got a world, they call them trolls. We got a world full of people who take the opposite side of a thing just because. They will, they will have a whole argument with you online, knowing they are dead wrong just because. Just because it's like, that's fun. I kid you not, I think this, all this LGBTQ, PLEP+, all that stuff, I think all of that thing started from somebody just messing with somebody else. I don't think they were serious at all. And I think it's just like, well, let's keep going with this. And then eventually, people start taking it serious. Because it's, if you take a step back, this stuff is just ridiculousness. The crazy stuff that we talk about, our daily conversation is ridiculous. Let's take it off of the LGP because that's an easy punching bag, right? Let's put it on our Hebrew brothers. The... The main conversation of our, if you go on any social media and you go to any Hebrew community, our main conversation is how many wives can we have? This stuff is silly. It's craziness. Nobody is focusing on the most high God's word. And things are getting to the point now that we fight and bicker over stuff that is clearly in the book. I'll be on the phone with somebody. Look, they, you know, they love to call me and argue. I'll be on the phone with somebody. I'll be sitting like, no, that, I mean, that is what it said. You know what I'm saying? Like, what, what do you want? Like, and they be like, well, I mean, you have to look at it a different ways. So you have to understand, brother. See, you know, God speaks to people in different times. We in 2023, we can't read the, Soon as you get to soon as you get to talking like that to me, I'd be like, hey, well, you got it then. You know what I'm saying? You got it. You know what I'm saying? Look, it ain't listen, I don't, I don't think you look, you've surpassed my teaching. You know what I'm saying? There is nothing that I can tell you at this point. 
you have graduated. You know what I'm saying? You've moved on to a whole, you in a different university now, boy. You know what I'm saying? I can't help you. You got to move on. You need a different tutor. Because they mind are, they, I'm not going to say they mind is made up. I think these people be messing with me. This is what I think. I think these people just be messing with me. I be looking like, can't nobody be that darn silly. I understand. I was that silly when nobody was there to show it to me. I can't imagine having a me or having a brother T to walk me through the book and tell me, hey, this is what it say. And this is, you know what I'm saying? There it is right there. Oh, and this is how you know it's true because this other verse say the same thing. I, I, I just have a hard time believing that if somebody sat me down and said that, I think I would at least be like, I feel you, but I still feel like sinning. I don't think I would sit there and be like, no, nah, that ain't true. No one I'm looking at and be like, yeah, no, nah, that's true. But I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Maybe. I know this day I'll be feeling like people messing with me calling my phone. That's all right. Keep calling. I'll take the call. You know what I'm saying? I'll give you the, oblig the obligatory three conversations. You know what I'm saying? You know what I'm saying? You get the obligatory. Is it, am I saying that word right? Obligatory? I don't Obli know. Obligatory. It's the obligatory. There it is. Obligatory. I would say obligatory. Yeah, it's the obligatory. You know what I'm saying? Re conversation. You know what I'm saying? After that, leave me alone. I don't want nothing to do with you. Ignoring all text messages. I go. To, I actually go a step further. If you look, if you give me three conversations, and I, I you know, what I'm saying, I tell you, okay, I'm done. You got it. And you wait about a year. And then reach out to me again, I will reset the counter. Usually I reset the counter on. I'm like, oh yeah, how you doing? You know what I'm saying? But that's just because I got a bad memory. Another another first time home buyer at that point, huh? Yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah, you you served your time, you know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and talk again, see if you came around. Uh let's uh let's finish out Romans chapter eight. This is Romans chapter eight. We probably what, verse 23, verse 24? 20, 24. This is Romans chapter 8, verse 24. Let's see what the book says. For we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For what a man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. So look, like, that's how the most high God gets you. Y'all arrogant, but listen, Christians be the most arrogant people walking on this earth in terms of religion, right? Got the nerve to call other people arrogant. Got the nerve to call other people self-righteous. People that lost their darn mind. I just be looking at people like, you got some nerve. You don't even know what you're saying. You got some darn nerve. So anyway, a Christian look at their life and they'll say, I'm saved. And I've been saved. Or I remember when God saved me. And they speak as if they already have obtained this thing. Meanwhile, Paul is explaining to us in Romans, who hopes for what they already have? So in other words, he's saying, if you already have it, then it's not hope. And if it's not hope, then guess what? It's not faith. It is not faith. It is not faith. Because Hebrews are going to tell you, you faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Right? So if it's not hope, then it's not the substance. Because you don't have hope. Right? And then in another place, um, what am I thinking of? First John chapter three, we don't have to get it, but in another place, first John chapter three will tell you um this hope, talking about the resurrection, this hope purifies us. Right? Mm -hmm. This hope will purify us. So that means if you already have it and it's not hope then you don't have the substance of faith and you don't have what it takes to be purified in the end. This is the trap. The whole book, if you don't follow this book to a T in terms of what's required, then you will find yourself in a trap. That's the warning. This is what we talk about. This is why we stress the importance of understanding the scripture. That's why I'll get up here and bumping my gums and running my darn mouth, but I need someone to be here to read the book to separate my voice from God's voice. That is the importance. 
Because if you learn everything I'm talking about, but never learn the book, never understand the book, then it's, a, it's, it's nothing. It don't mean nothing. And you never got to read the book in your life. But if you don't understand what the book is saying because of a teacher or because you read it or because of you listened to it or whatever, then it is for nothing. So it's my job to make sure what I communicate is aligned with the book. And because I don't want to trust myself, I want to lean on the book, I ensure that we have a red scripture for just about everything that we talk about. Because that is the importance of understanding the book. Otherwise, if you don't understand it and you just get to making willy nilly -nilly decisions, you will find yourself in a trap. You will find yourself saying, oh, yeah, now I remember when God saved me, not realizing that by doing that, you didn't confess that you don't have hope. Now, in your mind, that's not what you think. In your mind, you think I have absolute faith. But according to the book. It said, if you think you already got it, then it can't be hope. And because you never knew that in the book, you never modified your thinking. And now you got this 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 misunderstood understanding of faith. And now you don't have faith. You don't have hope. And now you're not saved. And you think you got saved 70 years ago. You think you got saved in 1999, right before Y2K. All the internets was going to get shut down. God came to me and he said, you know what? You are saved. I remember walking out of the church. Felt a cold breeze down my shirt. But it was a hot summer day. And that day I knew with my slushy in my hand. And that was when I got saved. Like, shut your darn mouth. Just making stuff up. Darn imagination. You saved in your darn imagination. That's uh where were we at? That's it. Go uh let's go back to uh second what were we at? Second Kings eleven. Second Kings is on Second Kings twelve now. It's 2 Kings chapter twelve. Give me verse one. In the seventh year of Jehu, Joash began to reign. In forty mm-hmm. years reigned he in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Zebiah of Beersheba. And Joash did that which was right in the sight of Yahuwah. All his days were in Jehoiada, the priest instructed him. But the mm-hmm. high places were not taken away. The people still sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. And Joash said unto the priest, All the money of the dedicated things that is brought into the house of the Lord, even the money of everyone that passes the account, the money that every man is set at, and all the money that comes into any man's heart to bring into the house of Yahuwah, let the priest take it to them. And every man of his acquaintance, and let them repair the breaches of the house, whatsoever any breach shall be found. But it was so that in the three and twentieth year of King Joash, the priest had not repaired the breaches of the house. When King Joash Hold called, on, let's see. Why, would, why do you think one of the first things that the book mentions that Joash wanted to do is fix up the house? Why do you think that might be? That's where he's raised. That boy was raised in the temple. You have to imagine that not very many people go in there except the priests. You have to imagine that when you got unrighteous kings, the priests ain't got no say-so. You got these kings that's letting people worship other gods, encouraging people to worship other gods, because we we friends with the, the northern kingdom, and that's what they do up there, right? So you got, you got, you got this string of kings that's letting people do whatever they want to do. The priests... Probably ain't, you know what I'm saying? They not with none of that anyway. But what say so they going to have if the if the king is not in agreement with them? So you get, the, you get the temple getting all messed up, chips in the wall, stuff breaking apart, need repairs. And you got the high priest that's raising this boy. And what you think, you know what I'm saying? Everybody, every one of us who had jobs or got jobs, right? We all got to complain about our job. Right? All of them got to complain about our job. Like, oh, they need to they need to upgrade these systems. Or they need to, you know what I'm saying, they need to stop working us so hard. They got us working overtime every Friday or every this day or every that day. Right? We all got our complaints about our job. So now imagine you got Jehoiada raising the young boy Joash. Jehoiada, you know what I'm saying? Like, you, know, you hungry, boy? 
Yeah, okay. Yeah, I just gotta give him my shift. And I'll tell you what, you know what I'm saying? That darn Athaliah, you know what I'm saying? She won't approve no funds to, you know what I'm saying, take care of the darn temple. And it ain't just her. You know what I'm saying? Your daddy was like that too, boy. And your grandfather. I'll tell you what, if they paid just uh, uh, as much attention to this temple as they did to go into the northern kingdom, things would be much better around here. That's why people all out of right, he just complaining. So now you see Joash, when he grows up, Joash is looking like, you know what? You're right. Because that's like his dad. He's looking like, yeah, this temple is a darn mess. So now you can imagine one to impress his father, or you know, the, the man that raised him, like, you know what I'm saying, like it's his father. You know what I'm saying? One to impress him is like, you know what? Whenever y'all get money, make sure it go to rebuilding this place. Right? Keep going. Watch this. And King Joash called for Jehoiada, the priest, and the other priest, and said unto them, Why didn't you repair the breaches of the house? Now, right? therefore. So years have gone by at this point. He gave him that command. Years have gone by. And he see, still ain't no repairs. So he's like, okay, okay, enough, enough. Why haven't these repairs got done? Let's see. And now therefore receive no money of your acquaintance, but deliver it for the breaches of the house. And the priest consented to receive no more money of the people, neither to repair the breaches of the house. But Jehoiada the priest took a chest and bored a hole in the lid of it and set it aside the altar on the right side of as one comes in, cometh into the house of the Lord. And the priest that kept the door put therein all the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. And it was so, when they saw that there was much money in the chest, that the king's scribe and the high priest came up, and they put up in bags and told the money that was found in the house of Yahuwah. And they gave the money, being told, into the hands of them that did the work, that had the oversight of the house of the Lord. And they laid it out to the carpenters and builders that wrought upon the house of the Lord. And the masons and the hewers of stone and to buy timber and hewed stone to repair the breaches of the house of the Lord and for all that was laid out for the house to repair it. Howbeit there were not made for the house of the Lord bowls of silver, snuffers, basins, trumpets, any vessels of gold or vessels of silver of the money that was brought into the house of the Lord. But they gave that to the workmen and repaired therewith the house of the Lord. Moreover, they reckoned not with the men into whose hand they delivered the money to the to be bestowed on the workmen, for they dealt faithfully. The trespass money and sin money was not brought into the house of the Lord, it was the priest. Then Hazael, the king of Syria, went up and fought against Gath and took it. And Hazael set, set his face to go up to Jerusalem. And Jehoash, king of Judah, took all the hollow things that Jeho Jehoshaphat and Jehoram and Ahaziah, his father's kings of Judah, had dedicated, and his own hollow things, and all the gold that was found in the treasuries of the house of the Lord, and in the king's house, and sent it to Hazael, king of Syria, and he went away from Jerusalem. And the rest of the acts of Joash and all that he did, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? And his servants mm -hmm. arose and made a, cons a conspiracy to slew and slew Joash in the house of Milo, which goes down to Selah. For Josachar, the son of Shemeth, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Shomer, his servant smote him, and he died, and they buried him with his fathers in the city of David. And Amaziah, his son, reigned in his stead. All right. So you can see that Joash was trying. Right? There's a little more to his life that, that we'll read in um that we'll read in Chronicles. Yeah, in Chronicles, and I think. We'll pick it up there. Yeah, with uh with uh the priest. You said what now? I think he had a small falling out of the of uh and a or something like that. Yeah, yeah. We'll 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 read some more of the details of his life, you know what I'm saying, Chronicles. But you'll see that when you look at his life in the, in the, or at least a piece of it that we looked at so far, he was trying, right? He was raised by the priest. He took the information that he had and he tried to do the right thing by it. Right, he tried to start cleaning stuff up. You're gonna see it's a, the there was some resistance, right? There was a little bit of resistance to what he was doing. Eventually, they start to get it together. He pay the people the money. They start to build stuff, and in the end, he end up getting set up. And we'll read some more about that. But that is the mind that we have to have. We have to take 
whatever is revealed to us, right? Whatever that the Most High God sees fit to give to us, we have to take that and we have to be vigilant with it. That's the, that's, so people look at it and they look at the whole pie and they say, oh, the Bible is so overwhelming. How, who can understand it? It's so unsearchable and all these. Okay, great. That is true, right? But the Most High God is going to reveal something to you. And that's going to be an internal thing, right? That's going to be something that you got to deal with internally. Nobody else can make that decision for you because we don't know what your, what's in your heart. The heart lied to us, right? And we won't know what's in there. But the Most High God is going to reveal something to you from what's in the book. And once that's revealed to you, you have to walk in it. That is the only way to understand this book. That is the only way to see the kingdom. You have to walk in it. The problem that we have is things are revealed to us and we pretend like we don't get it. Or we don't act on it. We don't practice it. We don't keep it in mind. We don't, we don't apply it to our lives. These are the things that we have to kind of look at and we have to try to see it. That's the reason why we break down the book this way. When we break it down, we don't leave it at just, oh, Joe Ash is repairing, you know, wanted to repair. No, why did he want to repair? Let's think about the scenario. Let's think about he would, where, where he came from. Let's think about who raised him. Put yourself in the shoes. Would you have made the same decision? What other decision would you have made if you, if you had the information that he had? Right? We have to look at it that way because when we look at it that way, now it helps us apply it to real life. Now it helps us to look at it and be like, oh, you know what? I made some decisions based off of how my dad raised me or how this person who I looked at like a dad raised me. Or how this person who I looked at like an uncle or whoever, they raised me. And when they raised me, I made decisions based off of the things that they liked and the things they didn't like. Right? And you know what? I was taught some good things. I mean, I had a rough life or I had this or this happened or this happened. But you know what? I was given some stuff that I could have ran with. And I did or I didn't. But you can start to examine your own life and you can say, okay. Now I see how I fit in the book. Now I see the characteristics that I have that are like some of the, some of the, the, the individuals that we're reading about. And now the Bible becomes practical, right? And that's, what, that's what's necessary. It has to be something that we can practice. Grab, real quick, grab Hebrews chapter 6. Grab Hebrews chapter six. Give me verse. Uh, give me verse ten. It's Hebrews chapter six, verse ten. I might want verse eight. Give me he Hebrews chapter six, verse eight. But that which bears thorns and briars is rejected and is near the cursing whose end is to be burned. But beloved, we are persuaded better things of you than that accompany salvation through though we thus speak. For God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have ministered to the saints and do minister. This is what you're looking for? No, keep going. And we should, and we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end, that ye be not slothful until the what? Until the end. It's important that y'all see it that way. If you look at it like I was saved six years ago when I walked in that church and the pastor told me to come up and sit in this chair and repeat after him. If you look at it in that moment I was saved, you're not going to look at. Oh, this is required into the end. You're going to look at it. Whew, I made it. Whew, I'm happy I made it. No, this is nothing that we're dealing with right now. We have to maintain this to the end. It's going to be the next thing that's coming. There isn't a, look, the world is changing right before our eyes. Very rapidly. It's changing politically. It's changing economically. It's changing spiritually. People are depraved. People are doing wild stuff out here. 
crazy stuff that you can't make sense of. People are getting to a point where they're not predictable. You can't find out what's going on. And that's going to create uncertainty in people. It's going to create fear. You're going to try to cower in your own house. You're going to cower in your, in, the, in, the, in your car. You're looking at all your mirrors and you're making sure because you don't know who's going to just turn their wheel and just fly off the, the end of the road. At work, you're scared of everything. You're scared of all the news. You don't even want to watch the news because the news is telling you stuff that you don't want to hear. Right. It's getting to a place where everybody is going to be living in uncertainty and uncertainty is going to give you fear. And it's already been there, but it is getting worse. The world is changing very rapidly right before our eyes. There's some big changes that I believe are going to come. I believe that because of the book. We have to be prepared and have certainty about who we serve, who we are and what correct decisions look like. If we don't have that certainty, if, we, if we're not certain on what is, what, what is required to have uh, faith, what is required to see God, then we'll be confused. Because yes, a Christian is gonna come up to you and say, no, 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 it's not about what you do, right? Jesus did all the work. It's not about your works. It's not about what you do. So you know what? It's self-righteous if you think that you can work your way into heaven. That's what the Pharisees thought. It's all these little weird things they're going to tell you. And it sounds good when you it actually when you don't know no better. It makes sense. You're like, you know what? Yeah, that is why Jesus came. He came so that I don't have to work. Until you stop being a dummy and you start looking at the book. Because when the book, when you look at the book, the book very clearly say, you're going to show me your faith without works. I'll show you my faith by my works. Then you can separate it and say, oh, I know what. The Christians are confusing the works of the law of Moses with the works of faith. Because nobody is going to be saved by the works of the law of Moses. That's a fact. But nobody is going to be saved if you don't have the works of faith. And what are the works of faith? What does that look like? That means you got to repent from all sin. Not just the ones that you, you know what I'm saying, that you comfortable with repenting from. No, no, no. You got to repent from all sin. That's the starting point. Then after you repent from all sin, then you got to walk in the fruits of the spirit. You got to walk in peace. Right. You got to walk in love and joy. Right. These are the things that you have to do and you have to continuously add on those things. So when I tell you that what we dealing with right now, I know right now we live in the moment and right now it feel like the worst ever for a lot of us. It feel like life is tough. It feel like we can't get a break. It feel like a lot of stuff. Right. And it feel insensitive when I look you in your face and I tell you, trust me, this ain't it. Keep moving. Stop making excuses. Go for it. We got a solution. It's just a simple decision. Make the decision. Right? I know it's hard. I get it. But don't make it harder in your brain. It's a simple decision. Do it or don't do it. Be honest with yourself about the decision you're making and move. Because I guarantee you what we're dealing with right now ain't it. It's coming. It's like what, what the Most High God told Jeremiah. Jeremiah came to him complaining like, oh, God, they after me. They at my head. They, they, the unrighteous are unfair to me. God, I'm speaking your word and they just beat me down and you let them, God. Why do you keep letting these people beat me down? It's not fair. Do I not serve you? Do I not speak the word that you give me? Right? And you let these people do these things to me. You're not protecting me, God. Right? That's the mindset that Jeremiah had. And the Most High God, this is God's man. Jeremiah doing everything he's supposed to do. Most High God responded to him and said, you know what? If you having trouble running with the footmen, what are you going to do when the horses come? In other words, he's telling them, this is about to get worse. This is just training. You on training wheels still. That's our life. That's how we have to look at it. When we start, it's just about turning away from sin. 
And we think that's the hard part. No, the hard part is when you got to turn away from sin, maintain that. You got to maintain that you're not sinning no more. Then after that, you got to continuously add a new mindset of peaceful thoughts and sacrificial love. Where people walk all over you, people think, listen, let me tell you what's going to happen when you get peaceful thoughts. When you get the peaceful thoughts and you calm and you got the demeanor because you got this confidence in God and you know everything always going to work out. Oh, that's when people going to try to break you down just to see if it's real. And not going to be satisfied until they break you. That's what you have to. That's what we're up against. This is the beginning. This is the footman. It's going to get tougher. And if your mindset is that you are already saved, you will never be ready for what's coming. It's never going to be ready. Your mindset has to be just what we just read. Read it again. For so God is not unrighteous to forget your work and labor of love, which you have showed towards his name, and that you have Listen. ministered to both and do minister. Listen, he's telling them, you already did work. He said, listen, the most I got, he ain't unrighteous. Look, he ain't going to forget that stuff. But he's letting them know, you already started work. That's how a lot of these people feel. Like, whoa, I did good. Like the game is over. No, no, no. Now, listen, God ain't going to forget the stuff you did. But what else you say? And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope until the end. Keep doing it. And he says with the same diligence. That means you can't take a day off. That means you can't sit there and be like, you know what? I mean, I did good, but I mean, I don't feel nothing. You know what I'm saying? Don't nobody appreciate it. It ain't about nobody appreciate. There's nothing nobody can do for you in this life. Everything we do got to be for God. We serve the most high God. We don't serve none of these people. Even the people that standing next to us. If you put your expectation and your hope in these people, in our brothers even, in our sisters even, you will be failed. You have to only keep your hope in God. Put your blinders on, look at God, and keep moving. Same diligence. Don't stop. Keep going. Watch this. We ain't even got to what I was looking for. That you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promise. But when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely, mm -hmm. blessed, I will bless thee, and multiplying, I will multiply thee. And mm -hmm. so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men verily mm -hmm. swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is to them an end of all strife, wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed in confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which it was impossible for God to lie, we might have a strong consol consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast in which sure and steadfast. Y'all have to pay attention to these words. There is no such thing as faith that is wavering. I see you in the chat, sister. No wavering. Right? There is no such thing as faith that is wavering. Back and forth. Kind of like, well, I kind of feel like, but maybe there's, that's not it. Those are signs. Listen, don't be real with yourself. If you feel like you're wavering, then be real with yourself. If you feel like you don't know, then be real with yourself. If you feel like it's a maybe, like maybe this verse is saying that, or maybe that's what God is saying, then be real with yourself, and that's how you feel. But know that as long as it's a maybe, as long as it's wavering, as long as there's uncertainty, just know that that is not faith and that you got work to do. And that's okay. It's okay to have work to do. But acknowledge it and do the work. But don't let yourself feel like you're in a good place when you're not. Acknowledge it. I know what I'm doing. I know I ain't supposed to be doing what I'm doing. And I know if I die today, I'm going right to hell. Live with that. Eat it. Feel it.
Because if that don't propel you to go forward at some point, then you know you meant to go to hell. But one thing is for sure, if you lie to yourself and make yourself righteous when you're not, you're definitely going to go to hell and you're going to be surprised when you get there because you're going to convince yourself, oh, I was saved 60 years ago. You can't have that mindset. Your mindset got to be, man, whatever God got in front of me, we're going to handle it today just like we handled it yesterday and it's going to be the same tomorrow. Keep going. Watch this. Which hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and steadfast, and which enters into that within the veil. Mm -hmm. What the forerunner is for us entered, even Yahshua made a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now watch this. For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the most high God, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also mm -hmm. Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Mm -hmm. Without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abides a priest continually. Now consider how great this man was unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. And verily that they, verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brothers, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received, from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And right. All that means that this man come before all this stuff. He has the, the, the word is preeminence, right? He, he comes before all of it. Right. And so that means he got to you have to settle it in your mind that nothing that you going through, there's nothing that tempts you. Right. That somebody else in this world hasn't overcome. Nothing. If you have if you have an addiction to fentanyl, they say that thing gets you. You know what I'm saying? That thing, they sprinkle that thing in some of some of the stuff you're doing. You know what I'm saying? You get you get touched with that thing, be like, ooh, mm -mm, give me the one with the little fenty in it. You know what I'm talking about? They say that thing gets you, right? If you got an addiction to fentanyl, you have to know that there are people that have overcome that. You have an addiction to porn. You have, you have this addiction to a person in your life that you just can't get away from. You can't find yourself away from. Listen to me. There are people in this world that have overcome those things. So you can't look at it and say, oh, there's so many things I need to overcome. No, no, no. Take them one at a time. Somebody has overcome this one. Somebody has overcome that one. Some over, okay, cool. So everything on your list, somebody has done it. Why can't God do it for you? It's your decision. It's your decision. It's just us. We just have to make the decision. We have to do the work and we have to hold ourselves accountable and we have to keep doing it because God came before all this. Yahushua came before all this. And he got to come before all this in our hearts. And when that happens, we can move and we can move with certainty. Right? We ain't going to be all wishy-washy. We're going to stand on what we stand on. Can't nobody tell us nothing. Can't nobody move us away from God. That is where we need to get. Whereas no matter what these people say, it don't matter how many. It's this one meme, right? It's this one meme, and you got this one dude against all this sea of people. And all the sea of people are saying the same thing to him in the meme. And then it got a little bubble over him and says, yes, you guys are all wrong. And that's, that's kind of like calmly, we have to kind of look at like, I get it. Like, relax, everybody relax. Put your wrong. It's okay. And I get it. It's okay that you got, and it's fine if you don't agree with me. But listen, you're wrong. I don't want you to be wrong. I don't feel better by you being wrong, but you're wrong. You're wrong. Right? Give me uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Give me verse, uh, Hebrews chapter 5. Give me verse uh, 10. This Hebrews chapter 5, verse 10. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek. 
of whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. But when the time you ought to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God. And All right, that's 10. That give, me, uh, mm, give me eight. So he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered. And Look, being made perfect. He although he were a son, this is Yahushua. Although he is the son of God, he learned obedience by what? By the things which he suffered. And being made perfect, he became the author of the author of eternal salvation unto them, all of them that obey him. Uh-huh. So now, if you obey Yahushua, he becomes the author or the writer of your name in the book of life. Your name is written in the book of life, and there's only one man who could put it there, and that's Yahushua. The condition for doing that is you obeying him. So we have to remind ourselves that that is the condition, and we have to ask ourselves, is this what we want for real? And we have to be honest with ourselves about the answer to that question. And we have to give ourselves grace, because if the answer to that question is, you know what, honestly, I want to sin a little bit more than I want that. Then I want salvation or then I want that. You have to be honest with yourself that that's what you want today and have grace on yourself that tomorrow that may not be the case. But do not lie to yourself. Keep going. Called of God, a high priest after the order of Melchizedek, from whom we have many things to say and hard to be uttered, seeing you are dull of hearing. For when the time you are to be teachers, you have need that one teach you again the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as need of milk and not of strong meat. Watch for this. Every, for everyone that uses milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness for he is a baby. But strong mm -hmm. meat for them that are full age, even those who by Look, reason... Look, it comes use, to those that are full age and what? In those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. So listen, it is important that we by reason of use, in other words, by practice and by exercise, learn to discern good and evil. And the only way you get there is by making the book practical. There's no other way. There's no other way. You will never understand right from wrong. You will never have clarity in this world. You will never have peace with God until you begin to make the word practical. In other words, practicing the things that you're learning. And you don't have to do it all at once. You have to, listen, you have to repent from all sin to be saved. But to get there, you don't have to do it all at once. You don't have to try to let the enemy overwhelm you by saying, man, I commit so many sins. Make small decisions. Do it. Follow through with it and keep going. And by the grace of God, we pray that you get it done soon enough before he take you out of this life. Because none of us know when it's going to happen. The only thing we know is what we got in front of us. And we have to be with all diligence. We have to be forward thinking. We have to make sure that we say, you know what? I'm done with this. I'm done with that. I'm done with it all. How do I increase peace? How do I increase love? How do I increase the sacrificial love? That's going to put my brothers on and after my brothers and my sisters, it's going to put the people in my neighborhood on. And after the neighborhood, then it's going to it's going to put the people in this world on or the people in this city on. And you keep extending and keep extending as long as you have the resource to do it. But first, you take care of you and your family. The next, you take care of your brothers and your sisters in the faith. Then maybe your blood biological brothers and sisters that's not in the faith. Then you move on to your community. Then you move on to your county and your city and you. Keep spreading out, but handle it in order. Take care of yourself first. Work out your own salvation. Stop playing with him because things are about to change. Any questions? I'm going to tell you, sister, sister Pamela, she got on me. She was like, you don't be given enough time to ask questions. So I'm gonna give it, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna give a little pause, you know what I'm saying? Give a little pause. Any question, you let me know if you got a question. I ain't read everything in the chat. Y'all look a little active today. Do it step by step. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Not the fence. <laughs> All 
All right, I'm gonna give y'all a little longer. Any questions? No questions? I ain't getting in trouble no more. Sabbath peace. I appreciate y'all. All right, well, let's pray out. Hey, I'm gonna ask, ask y'all specifically though. Uh, y'all keep me, y'all keep the family in y'all prayers. Um, uh, and, and keep each other in your prayers. Y'all get out there and y'all exchange numbers with each other and talk to each other, encourage each other along the way. It's rough. This thing get tight out here. And that's what the most high God, you know, that's what the wife, that's why the most high God put us together. But we don't have we don't have the same type of community that, you know what I'm saying, that 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 the saints of old had, right? The saints of old will all be in one city, all in one place, all together. And we don't necessarily have that. Most of the people, most of the people that we deal with, at least most of the people that I deal with, are now out of town. Right? Most people I talk to are not in the same city as me, not in the same place as me. So, you know, they fall on hardship. It's harder, it's harder for me to talk to. It's hard for me to deal with it. Right? And as my family falls on hardships, it's the same thing, right? It's harder, it's harder for y'all to, to to help me or to, to assist our family or to uh, uh you know to kind of be there. So it's, it's important in any way that we can be there for each other. Y'all reach out and y'all call. And, uh, uh, and and what I mean is you, I'm not saying, listen, call and y'all check on each other. That's great. I'm saying you as an individual, when you need something, when you need someone, you reach out and you call someone in our community that can help you. Right? Don't sit on it. Don't let, that's all mind games that the enemy does. I'm telling you, the stuff that we fight is all in our heads. I keep seeing it. I keep seeing it. Now I'm sick of it. I'm just getting tired of it, right? Because I'm seeing people fight stuff that's all in their head, right? We have to get to a point where we say, nope, I know the solution, and I'm going to just do it. And that means pick up the phone and call somebody. If that's what you need, if you just need somebody to talk to you, don't wait for them to call. Don't, don't listen. If you need somebody to talk to you, do not sit and wait and then complain and nobody talk to you. Nobody calls me. They don't care. No, if you need to call, call them. Just call like that. This is what I need. This is what I'm looking for. Get what you need. Get whatever you need and be relentless about it. That's the only way we're going to make it, especially, you know what I'm saying, with this unique situation we all got. You know what I'm saying? It's different from the saints of old. You know what I'm saying? We don't want the devil to get the advantage. Remember, the devil is our enemy. Our enemy. You know what I'm saying? Not God's. He's our enemy. We don't want him to get the advantage. Right? We got to keep the advantage. And the way we keep the advantage is through fellowship and obedience to the word. That's it. It's a simple game plan. It's just hard practically. But if we exercise it, man, I think it's easier to do. Let's see, if I get a question. I love y'all too. We love y'all. All right, y'all keep us in your prayers. We about to, you know what I'm saying? We 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 about to say a prayer here. Uh, I want y'all to be praying too. Pray a lot more, pray for each other. It's getting it's getting tight. It's getting late in the day. All right. Let's pray out. All right. Well,